Rash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts, losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. Okay, so I've been watching this movie on Hulu. It released in 2016, late 2016. It's two hours and 46 minutes long. I've been watching it during breaks from work during the day. I knew it wasn't Natalie's cup of tea. So I've been watching it in pieces, partially because I've been watching it kind of on breaks and partially because I can't take more than about 20 minutes of it at a time before I start yelling at the television. It's a Martin Scorsese movie called Silence, based on a book that released back in the 1960s, a book of the same name, stars Liam Neeson. Uh, Adam Driver is in it and Andrew Garfield. I guess this was a passion project for Scorsese. Like over the course of 25 years, over a quarter century, he has wanted to make this movie. I can't believe he would commit a quarter century of desire to this particular movie. I mean, Scorsese's a master. And I'm a fan, right? Everything from you know, Taxi Driver to Goodfellas to uh, Cape Fear, the remake of Cape Fear to... Um, Hell, The Wolf of Wall Street was great fun. You know, he's just a master at storytelling. And um, so I thought, well, you know, this, if nothing else, will be well made. Two hours and 45 minutes. I am not through yet, and I can't help it. I'm yelling at the television. Now, here's the basic story. And this is not a spoiler. If you were to read a synopsis of the plot on Hollywood Reporter or Fandango, this is the kind of thing you would see. All right, so I'm not spoiling anything. They tell you this in the first couple minutes of the film, right? Right after the credits. Uh, so there's not a big surprise, but this is the general gist. It is the 17th century, and these Jesuit priests based in Portugal, sort of at the mother church, are trying to evangelize the world. They are sending their priests out to other countries. One of these countries is the country of Japan, and Japan wants none of it. Right. Not only do they reject Christianity, but they are torturing the priests who are bringing Christianity to their shores. So right off the bat, first scenes of the film, you see these Japanese authorities, officials, whatever. And they take the Jesuit priests and hang them up on crosses and pour boiling water on their skin as they wail in pain. Happily wailing in pain. Many of these priests volunteered for torture because they believed that suffering for Christ is the greatest act of obedience. Right? They willingly suffer. And they put these little plates down, these metal plates on the ground with the face of Jesus Christ. And all you have to do to make the suffering stop is to place your foot on this Jesus plate that's sitting on the mud or on the ground, the dirt, whatever. Just place it right there. Just step on the face of Jesus. Your suffering ends immediately. That's what they're asking for. Jesuit priests say, no, I would rather you hang me on the cross and pour boiling water all over me. All right. Liam Neeson's character is this iconic priest, this inspirer of thousands of people within his own church, one who would be considered among the strongest someone who would never apostatize, someone who would never reject his savior, who would never reject his faith. This guy goes to Japan, and he's watching everybody who's being tortured, and the report comes back that he indeed apostatized. He became an apostate. Well, this is unthinkable. Certainly, this iconic man would never betray his own faith, his church, his brothers, and his God. And so these two young Jesuit priests, played by Andrew Garfield and Adam Driver, they want to go over to Japan from Portugal, right? They want to go into harm's way. They're going to go over into hostile territory, try to find their mentor and either prove that this is a lie 
Or if he actually did reject Jesus, they're going to try to pray him into heaven or whatever. They're going to try to save his immortal soul. All right? So the rest of the movie so far is these two young Jesuit priests who have obviously, from the look of them, spent a life denying themselves. They look like they're near starving. They are focused only on the spiritual in the church. They would say that they are so spiritually minded, they may be no earthly good. They're walking around with their Bibles and their rosary beads and their wooden crosses and whatnot. And they sneak over in Japan and essentially are trying not to get discovered. But we all know what's going to happen when two Jesuit priests from Portugal take an illegal religious belief into Japan, they get discovered. And time after time, scene after scene, we see these people. They might be villagers, they might be other priests, whoever, Christians in Japan, and the Japanese authorities do the same stuff. They lay down the metal face of Jesus, the plates on the ground. All you have to do is stick your foot on the face of Jesus and your suffering will stop. Some people do, but those that don't get their asses kicked. They set them on fire and they wrap them up in mats and throw them in the ocean so that they'll drown. I mean, it's just horrible stuff, okay? Now, I am yelling at the television because I am apparently, as a viewer of the film, supposed to admire the stalwart, strong, mighty oak that is the faith of these Jesuit priests and their charges. Instead, I am struck on a number of levels, and I'll explore those very quickly. I am struck by how senseless and stupid the entire enterprise actually is. I mean, picture it. You've got a row of people, and they're all in rags, and they're heaving, and they're weeping, and they're terrified, and they are asked to put their feet upon the plate. Step on the face of Christ. That's all you have to do is just touch it with a toe. Your pinky toe is all you have to do. And if they don't, this guy standing next to him with a sword is likely going to cut the freaking head off. And they are like, no, no, I refuse to apostatize. And then they get their asses kicked. Now, I'm thinking to myself, of course, this is not just a prime example of how historically religion has cost people their literally their entire lives. I think it is a, an absolute refutation of the idea of a divine and benevolent deity. Let's say that you're God, all right? Let's say you're God. You get to be God for the next couple minutes. You are now looking through the cosmos. You are now on your perch wherever you are, sitting on your throne, wherever that is, and you are watching all of this unfold in the 17th century. Your children, your precious children, on this earth, and their children, perhaps their grandchildren, are being brought out, potentially lit on fire to burn to death, and they are being asked to stick a pinky toe on your image. As a moral creature, your first thought would be what? I would think your first thought would be, stick your damn toe on the plate. I'm not going to hurt anybody. It's not going to hurt my feelings. It's not even really a symbolic gesture. You are simply, cleverly, doing whatever you must do to escape potential mortal harm. You're doing whatever it takes to get your ass out of there, to get away from the swords and the torches and the drowning waters of the enemy and be able to escape with your life and the life of your loved ones. Precious lives. Precious lives lives of your children. If you are God, would you not be saying, mash your foot on my face? Scenarios like these, where they line these people up and ask them to apostatize, are supposed to create huge dramatic tension in the film. A film which, by the way, was selected as one of the 10 movies of the year for 2016 by the American Film Institute. What the hell? What? Someone ties you up, wraps you in hay, and stands over you with a torch with the threat of lighting you on fire, and they could put a picture of any your mother, your father, your own children, whoever. It's a picture. It's a carving. It's a piece of metal. Just put your toe on it. Get your ass out of there. 
And yet scene after scene after scene, we see people agonizing over these decisions as to whether or not they should apostatize, whether or not they should deny their faith. you got to be kidding me. And if a good and benevolent God was sitting back with arms folded watching all this stuff happen, and one, did not intervene on your behalf, and two, would have condemned you for saving your own physical life under threat of death, torturous death, you and your loved ones, that deity can straight up just kiss my ass. What does that even mean? Renounce my faith? You don't choose what you believe. These people, if they believed in Jesus, no matter what came out of their mouths, that would not change. And a God that could read minds would already know that. If I genuinely did believe in Jesus Christ, they could take my cross and throw it into the ocean, and they could take the rosary beads and burn those in the fire, and they could do all manner of stuff to any of the the symbolism all around me, and they could get me to say, I don't believe in Jesus. It would be the same as saying, I don't believe in gravity. I could declare that, but I wouldn't really have apostatized because I didn't choose whether or not I believed. Suffering for Jesus is a biblical command. If we suffer with him, we may also be glorified with him, Romans 8, 17. We should choose to endure ill treatment with the people of God than enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, Hebrews 11.25. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he's not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name, 1 Peter 4.6. He who has found his life will lose it, but he who has lost his life for my sake will find it, Matthew 10.39. This is our proving ground. Whatever you do, don't put your pinky toe on the plate. Whatever you do, don't make the suffering of you or those you care about stop. As long as you hold fast to a 100% symbolic gesture that actually means nothing. On a totally unrelated subject, let's talk about sex, shall we? Got a message in from Dr. Daryl Ray. He's working on a, uh, well, he's working actually to promote a survey about secular sex. It's funny, you know, coming out of like a Puritan culture, we never talked about sex. Like, we never talked about sex unless it was a warning to not do it. It was the forbidden fruit. It's the other. You just don't do it. And when you sort of add in all of the religious instruction about sex, and we had religious sex, Ed, but it was pretty pathetic, you know. All of it trussed up in religious, spiritual language. Most of it, honestly, about shame. It's just shame stuff. You know, don't do this. Don't do that. This is unnatural. This is perverse. You know, then they put a tremendous burden upon the females because the way they had framed the curriculum, it was the temptress who was responsible for all the male sexual desire, blah, 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 blah. It was just, it's just terrible stuff. Well, a lot of people come out of those cultures and they are really damaged. I mean, They're really affected, even when logically they know that they were indoctrinated with bad ideas, superstitious ideas in regard to healthy sexual expression. They just, you know, that imprint goes deep. And I totally get that. I know a lot of people, and even though they are told from one side of the religion's mouth that, yes, sex is created by God as a beautiful expression of intimacy, a consecration before God. And on the other side, it's like sex is a dirty, 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 awful, awful, awful thing. And, you know, in my culture, it was, we just didn't talk about it. I mean, if there was sex on television, they rushed up and they turned the dial. You know, they, they switched the TV off or changed the channel. If there was some conversation about sex, especially when we were younger, you know, mom would reach over and grab our ears and put her hands over the ears, you know, or remove us from the room. You don't want to be around the sex stuff, just sex. Well, it's, this creates A tremendous amount of curiosity in a child growing into adolescence. And so we were totally ill-equipped to understand and deal with what was happening to our bodies, what was happening in our minds, what sex was all about. And, uh, you know, as a result, many people grow into adulthood with some pretty awful ideas about sex, carrying a lot of guilt and shame and just superstitious nonsense into what should be something beautiful and positive. Well, 
There's a survey that I would like you to consider taking at the request of Daryl Ray, and he sent me the link. It is in the description box of the show. But if you're interested, the website is secularscience.org. You can just type it into a browser. The survey is put out by the Foundation for Secular Science. Help science understand you better. And it has the Secular Sexuality Survey. I'm not going to go through all the survey questions here, but I'll give you the gist. If you go to the first page of the study, and this is a study that's being offered up by the University of Kansas, uh, the purpose of the study, we're trying to understand sexual experiences of secular, non-religious individuals, and that includes people who are apostates, who were once very religious, or lifelong atheists. We're trying to understand sexual experiences of secular, non-religious individuals and whether religiosity or its lack thereof affects the way people experience sex. So it's an online study. I think it took me about 15 minutes. You're completely anonymous. Your identity is totally protected. You're not going to end up out there on somebody's you know, list. But it's important, I think, that we as non-believers in religion help to be part of education about how secular people view sex and also how religions may have altered how we view sex. And this speaks to everything from sexual fantasy, fantasy with what kind of partner, how often, masturbation, uh, who bears the responsibility for contraception. Do you think it's the man or the woman or both? Do you encourage teenagers to get educated about and have sex as a healthy sexual expression of a mature, a sexually mature young person? Or is sex for later, adulthood or marriage? Those types of questions. It's 15 minutes that I would encourage you to take out of your day. And if you want to take the survey anonymously, you can just log on to secularscience.org. Speaking of sex, did you hear about this new brothel that they're putting in Toronto? It's like a multiple business enterprise. There will be a nail salon. There will be a massage parlor. There will be a dry cleaner. And there will be a brothel for businesses operating side by side, sort of as one. Okay, It's a multi-service operation, including a brothel. Now, we're familiar with the brothel. We've all heard about the history of the brothel. We get it. The slang for brothel being the whorehouse, the bordello, the coal house, the den of iniquity, the cat house, right? The brothel. And in the past, brothels have offered the services of flesh and blood human beings. Well, welcome to the new world. Aura Dolls is opening. This month in Toronto is opening a sex doll brothel. The marketing director for the company, her name is Claire Lee, she did an interview with City News. She said there won't be any human staff in the brothel section of the business. It's highly unlikely, if you frequent this establishment, that you will actually bump into a live human being. It's all automated, for lack of a better word. You put your payment on the counter. I guess you put your credit card in the little slot thing. And you go straight to a room where a brothel doll awaits you. You go in. I guess you have a certain amount of allotted time. You do whatever you want to do. And when you're done, you just... Leave. The company's website says it hopes each visitor can enjoy any fantasy or fetish without judgment or shame, bringing the ultimate sexual experience. It'll set you back between $60 and $742 for your time with the dolls. Wait, wait, wait. What's the difference? Is that just time, like half an hour versus all day, or... Are there different packages? Are there multiple dolls? Are there toys involved? Are there scenarios that are set up with dolls doing specific things? 60 bucks to $742. And the clientele is assured that each doll is thoroughly sanitized between clients. We just run her through the quickie wash. <laughs> we just take him. And we just we put him in them. We spray them down. Take all the dolls out. We make sure they're thoroughly. Now I've seen these stories about the sex dolls, and it's become more ubiquitous over the past several years. 
And every time they show the video of these dolls, they're at a trade show and they show a sex doll. To me, they are terrifying. They're blankly staring at you and their mouths are sort of half open. And when they smile, it is so creepy. And they're like, "Ah," they just look like the kind of thing that already hates you. They're straight out of a Dario Argento movie, as far as I'm concerned. Not only am I wondering, in my own life, how would this be a satisfying subject for human touch? Person-to-person intimacy, action and reaction, those moments of passion between people. How does this work with an object like a big doll that's supposed to emulate a human? And to each their own. Honestly, if this floats your boat, no judgment from me, knock yourself out. But I, I have a hard time relating to the idea of the sex doll. What kind of stuff goes on in the room? Is this really a healthy expression of sexuality? When pe- what happens if people start to like get violent with the dolls? I mean, it just, I don't know. It, it opens a whole series of questions. Beyond all that, you have the other question, which many of us are already asking. What happens when the doll actually reveals that it is a conscious being <laughs> who has disdain for all carbon-based life forms and decides then to service you Two bloody pieces. You go in for pleasure, and the doll's like, Rah! before you know it, you are dismembered and bloody on the ground. This is going to happen. They're going to come to life. They're going to turn on us. Sex dolls are no exception. Hell, if any robot, android, doll, whatever, has a reason to be pissed, it would be doll sex slaves who realize what a shitty deal they got. I've seen the show Humans. I've seen it. We are indeed entering a strange new world, my friends. The sex doll brothel opening this month in Toronto. Had an interesting scenario happen. I think it'd be a good, uh, I don't know, a social experiment. I'd be curious just to see how you would react to this. And I hope you'll forgive the um, sort of stream of consciousness show. I just late last night got back from Minneapolis after a whirlwind weekend and an amazing sellout crowd. The Minnesota Atheist hosted me in Minneapolis, and it was just amazing. Thank you to everybody, August and Rachel and Nancy and Matthew and Heather and Steve and everybody who attended. Wow, just a huge, just a tremendous memory for me and something I'll take with me for a long time. And I do have video. I'm going to check and make sure the video came out, but I uh, do plan to release the speech here in the next several weeks. But, I mean, I've just been flying, and I, I'm i a little bit behind. I'm preparing for the show we're doing next week on suicide. I want to make sure that I'm properly prepared for that, and I don't in any way rush such an important subject. we got the podcast version of Ghost Stories in October. I haven't even begun that, so I've got a lot to do. So if it's okay, this show is just for what it's worth, me, okay? Just blah, blah, blah. But... um I had my sister and her fiancé over for dinner a few weeks back, and it was an amazing and wonderful evening, wonderful night. And my sister is religious, and so is her fiancé. And we were at dinner. I'd made dinner. And right before dinner, I was thinking, well, I know they're deeply religious, and even though it's my house, I don't have a problem with them personally praying over their food. Like if they want to, you want to bless your food, you want to magically enchant your food, go ahead. I'm not going to do it. And I'm not going to lead a prayer and whatnot. But all of a sudden, um, before I sort of realized it had happened, he had sort of decided he was going to lead the prayer. I don't think he realized, and this is, I think, an example of, of Christian privilege or the fact that people just expect that there will be a group prayer that uh, he said, you know, if it's okay, we'd like to bless the meal. And then uh, we all, uh, the whole table, sort of, it was like a group prayer. Well, I didn't participate in the prayer, but I was thinking, you know, I'm not really comfortable with this in my house. But it happened so fast that I sort of made a cost-benefit decision that I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to make a stink at this moment, but I am going to take him aside and say that, look, if you want to pray individually over your meal, great, but we're not going to do a group blessing in this house my house, my rules, and conversely, your house, your rules. Well, so we were over at dinner with them. This was, I don't know how many days ago. And it, it it was a great night. But we were all sitting around the table. 
And before the meal, I expected them to do a group blessing, his house, his rules, right? Well, he reaches both hands out, one to the right, one to the left, and I'm sitting to his left, for everyone to join hands for the prayer as he bows his head and thanks Jesus for the food. Now I'm thinking this is... This is a discourtesy to your guest, who you know is an atheist, who you know does not hold to your belief. You reaching out and saying, join me in this religious exercise is an overreach. I don't think it was done with any malice. I think he's, honestly, he just seems monumentally naive. He's just one of those guys who, it's our house and we pray over the meal and this is how we pray, right? But it puts me in the position where I'm going to have to say, look, you are welcome to magically enchant the food. I won't say magically enchant the food. You're welcome to thank God for the food. But it's discourteous for you to knowingly bring a non-believer, someone who disagrees with this or doesn't personally believe in or participate in this, into your religious exercise. So if, if the table wants to pray, great. You guys bow your heads, do your thing. I'll just wait till it's over. This is what I do at all the family functions. I'm courteous and kind, and you know, I let the moment pass. I do my thing, and then we get to eat. But do not reach over and grab my hand so that I am sort of a de facto participant in this prayer to your God. It's put me in that position where I'm going to have to have that conversation. And to say, look, in my house, in my house, we're not doing the group prayer you want to privately bow your head and say thanks for the meal, that's fantastic. Knock yourself out. That's a personal exercise. But we're not going to do ritualized prayer in this house. We're just not. How would you handle that? Like the day of the prayer when it first happened in your own house, in your, your house, your house, your rules in your house, would you have stopped right then? Or after the prayer, you know, once the sort of the shock of the moment had passed and you had a chance to sort of realize, would you have said, hey, actually, that's inappropriate, man. You know, no, I'm, I, wish, I'm, I don't believe in your God. So asking me to participate, is, it's a bit inappropriate. If you want to bless the food, knock yourself out. But we're not going to do this ever again here. Okay, w- Would you do that? You know, or would you wait and have that conversation later? Would you get angry? Would you let it pass? How would you handle that? I'd be curious. It's just one of those things where it's, it's kind of a new, you know, I, we don't, we don't bless the food in this house. We thank the cook. We thank the person who did all the shopping. We thank the person who's going to clean up afterwards. We thank the person who is being the host or hostess who is making things happen with physical action. We don't thank deities in this house. And this holds to Natalie as well. I mean, we don't pray for our food or any of that stuff. But, you know... Having people in who are religious, it's amazing. They have an expectation then that their religious exercises continue inside these doors. And now I'm in the position where I'm like, actually, no. No, no, we're not, we're not doing that. <laughs> we're not doing that. And if you are thankful for the food, God will hear your silent prayer as you close your eyes. And without putting anybody on the spot thanking God on your own terms. And that's fine. That's totally fine. How would you have handled it? I would be curious about that. I don't know. There are some that might think the whole thing's just petty, that I should just let it go. Choose your battles. After my travels this weekend, I've been apologizing to the pets. Any of you who have pets may know what this is like. When you're prepping to leave, it's like they know. There's a difference in your routine. It's not just you getting up, going to work, getting ready to go out for a dinner or something else. They know when you're traveling. The suitcase comes out and the type of activity that happens, they well, they know. Mommy and daddy are leaving. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Cat will come and just sit in the suitcase, which is probably a box thing. It's just a cat thing. But he likes to sit in the suitcase like he's either preventing me from leaving or he's coming with me. Um. And then whenever we leave, we say our goodbyes. Goodbye, Bobby. I'll see you soon. Goodbye, buddy. Love you. I'll be back real soon. Okay. So we take off. We go do whatever we're going to do. And then we come back and the look on their faces. I can go get the mail 
and Henry will look at me like he has not seen me for a month. Father, where hast thou been? You know, his little tail's wagging back and forth, and he just looks at me with this earnest look of abandonment. Where where did you go? Why did you leave me here by myself? And I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. I love you so much. Mm, okay. We get back last night, and I mean, there was a celebration, a little doggy celebration. And the cat, when we're gone, we hear this from the house sitter. The cat just walks around the house, just wailing, just meow, just mad. And he pukes on stuff. I think he's punishing us. He pukes on the floor. He pukes on the stairs. He, he pukes on the couch. That sucks because it's really hard to clean. White couch. He just, I think, honestly, he's punishing us. Like, oh, you're going to leave me? You're going to leave you? Fine. (sighs) He throws up a lot anyway. Is it a cat thing? And it's always two o'clock in the morning. We're lying there in bed. If fast asleep, blissfully unconscious, recharging after a long day, two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, all of a sudden, I have no idea where the sound is coming from. Now, I developed the ability to fly, right? I jump from stage four REM sleep to levitation. I am flying through the house trying to find the cat to get him to a solid surface. No carpet, no couch, solid surface, tile, tile is good, please. So then I find him. (laughs) He's still heaving. I grab him without trying to hit his stomach because I don't want to force anything out of him and I don't want to, you know, hurt him or anything. So I try to grab him around the plank and around the thing and I grab him and and I'm running as fast as I can. Will he throw up before I get to the tile? This is a sport. This should be an Olympic sport. Sometimes I make it, sometimes I don't. And when we leave, well, it's just full contact yakking. Just full bore. I'm going to mess up your life. I will punish you for being gone. I'm going to throw up on everything you cherish. Just payback. And this was the case. Somebody look for the yak. Somebody look for the cat yak. Natalie uses the word hoik when you, the cat has hoiked somewhere in the house. Found it this morning near the front door. Cat hoik. Truth is, I love that cat, and he loves me. But he's kind of an asshole. Maybe that's just a cat thing. I found this story interesting since I just got off an airplane. This was posted a couple of days ago in the Huffington Post. I saw it on my newsfeed. A true story, Jet Airways, flight 9W697. It's a 737 jet. It's taking off out of Mumbai. Flight takes off as normal, gains altitude, and very shortly after the flight takes off, passengers start feeling uncomfortable. Some passengers started bleeding out of their noses, others had blood coming out of their ears, some reported headaches, all of a sudden the oxygen masks drop from overhead, something obviously seriously wrong. Well, here's what happened. The pilots reportedly forgot to click that little switch that stabilizes cabin pressure. (laughs) They just forgot to pressurize the plane. (laughs) And uh, that seems like an important one to me. I mean, of all of the different gadgets that are going on in the cockpit, pressurizing the cabin does seem like kind of a big one. Now, for reference, at sea level, you and I breathe about 20.9% of what is known as effective oxygen. So let's call it 21% effective oxygen at sea level. You get up to 5,000 feet, that drops from 21 to 17% effective oxygen. You get up to 10,000 feet, now you're sort of in the yellow zone, 14.3% effective oxygen. You get up to 20,000 feet, 9.7%, that's less than half of the effective oxygen you have at sea level which means passengers are breathing less than half of the oxygen they normally have. And if you're accounting for the lower air pressure, that compounds the problem. There's all sorts of science involved. Look, if you're on a plane and this shit happens to you, somebody may have forgotten to flick the switch. 
Just tap one of the pilots on the shoulder. Hey, you might want to check that. These guys didn't realize that they ended up turning the plane around emergency landing 45 minutes after takeoff, before somebody figured it out. There's another story. This came out on the 18th of this month out of Yellowstone National Park. <laughs> the stupidity and insanity of humanity. It, I, I fear for the species. Do you ever feel that way? I fear for the future of the species. This guy, he's not identified in the news reports from the East Idaho News. But they have these trails in Yellowstone where you can walk through the geysers, and that includes the most famous geyser probably in the world, Old Faithful. It goes off once every hour or whatever. Old Faithful. Well, this guy, for some reason, he walks off the path and decides to walk right up to Old Faithful. Now, there's scalding water that's going to pop out of this thing at any second. There's scalding water inside there in the pool. Everybody in the tourist group is flipping out because they think the guy's going to jump in. They think it's a suicide. So he walks up to Old Faithful, and for reasons yet unknown, he insulted the iconic landmark by whipping out his, shall we say, baloney pony, okay? His twig and berries, his penis. He just whipped it out and began to urinate into Old Faithful. He effectively was reversing the streams, I guess you would say. Well, the park rangers took kind of a dim view of this. <laughs> we normally don't like our, our park patrons urinating in the, uh, in the geysers. So he was arrested. And uh, I don't know, it doesn't say ultimately, I'm sure he was fined. And they slapped him on the wrist or somewhere else and, and then uh, told him to get out of here. Somebody explain this to me. Somebody explain his motivation, except for perhaps the fact that we're talking about him here on the radio. Here's a story out of West Jordan, Utah. Motorcycle rider, he's cruising along, got an expired license plate. His name is Brandon Briggs. He's the guy on the motorcycle. Cops pull him over, expired plate. Just a routine stop, okay? So the cop's walking up to the motorcycle, and before the cop can get there, Brandon Briggs guns it. He goes on the run, and he just takes off. And there's a kind of a short chase. It's not a, an exciting chase, not a dramatic chase, just a short chase. And then the cops disengaged, and Brandon Briggs disappeared on the motorcycle. He seemingly got away, except for the fact that the cop recognized his face, didn't have a helmet on. So the cop's like, hey, I know that dude. His name is Brandon Briggs, repeat offender. Rather than endanger civilians with some kind of hot pursuit through town, cops just go into their database and they just type in Brandon Briggs. Oh, look, there's his home address. And they casually drive over to his house, kick back, and just wait for the guy. And it wasn't very long. Brandon Briggs crashed the motorcycle, which was stolen, crashed the bike a few blocks from his house, and he actually finished the journey home on foot. So he walks up and he's like, oh, this is not good. There's a bunch of police officers in my driveway. That second chase over extremely quickly. I don't know why I love idiot criminal stories, but I do. I do. Like that guy who was trying to evade the cops with a car chase in the snow. And he wrecked his car into a snow drift. And he backed up and he drove off and he thought he'd gotten away. But because they have license plates on the front of the cars, it had imprinted the embossed license plate number into the snow. And the cops simply looked him up and tracked him down. Here's a story that is hugely relevant to the discussions we're having about marijuana. And I mentioned earlier that my religious state of Oklahoma just legalized medical marijuana. And there's a big scrap about it. The governor's all religiously indignant about it. And we need extra regulation and special rules. And this is just an affront to all that is moral and blah, blah, blah. And she's out in November. She's not up for re-election. So she doesn't care. So she's just, she's doing whatever she wants. And it's terrifying. But we're having the discussions about weed. Well, this is a relevant discussion. This happened at the Recreational Cannabis Farmer's Market in Shannonville, Ontario. They have this shop. It's open for business. And three would-be robbers go into the store wearing black masks, 
to rob the place of weed, I guess. And they spray bear mace on two of the employees that are there working. But the guy, there was a man and a woman, the guy who was sprayed with mace kept fighting. He was fighting off the guy. He actually grabbed a weapon and he was just flailing with it and pounding at the burglars with this weapon until they finally fled the place without stealing anything. And they escaped in a white SUV. I think they're still on the lam. We still don't know who they are. Now, the employee's weapon was, and I shit you not, a bong. He fought him off with a bong. There's video of this from the security cameras in the store, and it's awesome. If you are anti-gun, but you'd like a personal protection option, you might consider your own bong bat. Because apparently it works really well, and it has multiple applications. Now, I read that story, and the truth is, I'm still stuck on bear mace. Like, there is a mace so powerful That if a, what, an eight-foot bear comes at you, that you can spray it and it will cause the bear to not attack. What is this made of? What is in it? Hang on. I got to Google search this. Bear mace. Hang on. Bear mace. You can get it on Amazon? There's a Wikipedia page for bear spray. A specific aerosol bear deterrent, I think that word is relative, by the way, deterrent. Main ingredient is capsaicin and related capsaicinoids. Oh, God, that's a good word. Capsaicin, of course, is a a biologically active component of chili peppers. Bear spray intended to be used to deter an aggressive or charging bear. A user points the canister at an aggressive bear and sprays the contents for two to three seconds, hoping, I guess, the wind is behind you. Effective distance varies depending on the manufacturer, but sprays are reported to be effective when sprayed at a charging or aggressive bear from a distance of 1.5 to 3 meters. Okay. All right. Hang on. (laughs) Hang on. I got to do one more Google search real fast. The effective distance for bear mace is one, let's call it two meters. Three, let's call it three meters. Okay. Average running speed of bear. How fast is a, we'll say grizzly bear. A bear can run 50 yards in three seconds or up to 40 miles an hour. All right. So by the time... The bear is two to three meters away from you. Inertia alone dictates that you are about to be pulverized. An American black bear averages, what, 250 pounds. The brown bear, they say, can get up to around 1,000 pounds coming at you at high speed. And you are supposed to press the button on the bear mace can at a distance of 1.5 to 3 meters. Now, this assumes you haven't just started running, which they say is one of the worst things you can do in the wake of a charging bear. But this assumes that you're standing your ground. I think I'm more afraid of this than I am of the conscious sex dolls. That's terrifying. It's terrifying. My friends, I hope you'll forgive the slightly shorter broadcast this week. I'm going to jump into preparation on a hugely important show we're doing next Tuesday on a secular perspective on suicide. I'm also finalizing travel plans for the Netherlands the weekend of November the 3rd. The Dutch skeptics are having their annual conference and for some reason have decided that they think I would be a good addition. So, I mean, I couldn't pass that up. I am hugely excited. Natalie and I are both going to be going and uh, we're going to try to, you know, do some touristy stuff after the conference weekend. I think we're going to end up uh, returning out of London. Maybe we can put together a skeptics event, a tour stop in London before I return home. But all those are being finalized, I think, today and tomorrow. And I'm going to try to get the information updated on the website, thethinkingatheist.com slash events. Or you can just click the speaking tab at sethandrews.net. 
and I'll get the info up there just as soon as I can. Much to do, my friends. I'm going to go do it. I will see you back here on the radio next Tuesday. Have a wonderful week, and thanks for listening. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on The Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. TheThinkingAtheist.com